I'm Tony Ruiz, contributing editor at Gold Derby, here with Daniel Rohr, who is uh, Oscar-nominated and just recently won a BAFTA for uh, his documentary, Navalny. And and Daniel, I want to kind of just jump right in here, because this clearly is not a film that uh, is made under normal circumstances. You know, you've got so many elements, um, you know, both political pressure, social pressure, and dealing with this, this very high-profile uh, almost lightning rod of an, of an individual. So first of all, what made you decide that you could actually pull this off? And did you ever have any doubts that you could pull it off? Well, first and foremost, Tony, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's so great to be here with you today. Um, did I ever have any doubts that, that we would pull this off? Well, to be honest, we didn't have time to have doubts. The way that this film came together, it was such a fever dream, lightning in a bottle, uh, experience for me. There wasn't sort of the meditative quiet time required to think and have self-doubt. It was just go, go, go. And once we finished shooting the film and the editorial process began, that was just a question of, of not screwing it up and, and making sure we, 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 we did a good job putting the film together. And Alexei Navalny is such, he's such a charismatic individual. Um, and that certainly comes across on the screen, like you can tell why this is a guy that ha has built up the the following that he has and who has the kind of social and political power that he does have. Um, at the same time, I, I noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, I noticed that there's definitely um, a distance in the man. Um, I, there's there's that great scene at the beginning where he's kind of telling you the type of film he wants to make. Um, and so so what was your interactions with him like? And did you find yourself, you know, did that distance kind of maintain itself throughout the process? Well, I actually wouldn't characterize it as a, as a distance. Navalny and I had a very healthy, friendly relationship from the very beginning. I think it was our shared sense of humor. Actually, he's a very funny man, as you see in the movie. And I think that was what not bonded us, but made us work well together. He liked to take the piss out of me and I'd give it right back to him. Um, <laughs> but of course, this is a man who is very charismatic, very charming. And he's a politician and a politician whose great gift and great strength is his mastery and understanding of media and social media. And so the question on my mind from the very beginning was, how is this guy weaponizing me? How am I part of his political calculus. And uh, that had to be top of mind from the very beginning. So in the opening of the film, what you just alluded to, I asked him a question and he says, no, 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 no. I'm not answering that question. We're making this film a thriller. Make it a thriller. He's directing me. And I really liked the premise of, of sort of kicking off the film by introducing both Navalny and also the meta narrative of the movie. What is it to make a film about a politician? What is it to make a film about a politician who's got this mastery of media and social media? And what is that filmmaker subject tension? And, and that sort of subtext is threaded throughout uh, the entire film. I, I, I love the, the, the juxtaposition of him giving you direction at the beginning of the film and the film ending with you giving him kind of the direction, the, the final direction of the film. Yeah, I, re I really appreciate that observation. Obviously that bookend was quite intentional. Um, the tension that I spoke to earlier of who's directing who uh, is present throughout the movie. And I think it culminates with the final moment when he, when he asks me, when I ask him a question and he gives me a really lame answer. And then I say, you know what, Navalny, do it again, but this time say it in Russian. I give him the final direction and he delivers. Um, and that was one of our ways of signifying, no, 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 no. This is our film. We're in the driver's seat. You don't have control over this process. Um, and uh, I think that that sort of tension and maybe conflict makes the film even more interesting. And I love the fact that, that he tells you in the beginning to make this a thriller because that's really what this is um there's so much tension um and and moments of relief from that tension but of course is there a, during the making as as you're editing this film putting the putting this together um how much is he is that direction of making this a thriller how much of that is in your mind well i wanted to make it a thriller because i wanted to make it a thriller not because navalny wanted mm. me to make it a thriller that's very important navalny and his and his supporters were 
uninvolved in the editorial process, largely, I mean, partially because Navalny was in a gulag and we had no communication with him. Um, but for his staff, whom we were in regular communication with, there was quite a bit of frustration and tension at times about who was running the show and who was controlling things. But I told Navalny from the very first meeting that if he wanted to work with me on the project, it was my show and I was running the ship. And I think that's something that he, um, I think that's something that he appreciated uh, and he understood. Um, so uh, we were off and uh, true to my word, it was truly my film. And, and although there was a lot of tension in the editorial process, uh, the film was very much crafted as, as we aspired it to be. Do you think that that tension in the editorial process actually helped inform the, the, the final product? Um, I don't know that it helped inform the final product product because it would be the same no matter if Navalny's people were happy with me or not. The fact that they were often displeased with me and very frustrated was a giant pain in the ass and something that you just have to contend with and, and manage. But of course, there's an inherent conflict and tension when you have someone who is like Navalny is one of his lieutenants who's very who are very cautious and careful about his public image. Um, if we put something in the movie that they don't like, uh, they got really upset about that. And we had to ha be very strong willed and stick to our guns, which which we had no problem doing. Uh, and feel free to to not answer this, but are, can, can you was there something specific? Was can you give me an example of something that they didn't like that that ended up in the final film? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's one moment in, in the first act of the movie where we talk about Navalny's uh, flirtation with with Russian nationalists. He appeared at these very controversial, very weird rallies about 10 or 15 years ago uh, that took place in Moscow. Um, and of course, we're making a film about a politician. I don't want this to be a puff piece. We need to have a critical eye towards our subject. And we, we understood that it was mission critical to include this part of his backstory uh, into the film. And we understood that the best way to do that was to show the clip of him at this rally, speaking to this crowd. And then I confront him about it. And we have a very tense sort of back and forth where he essentially says, uh, I don't have the luxury of alienating myself from people who make me uncomfortable. The enemy of my enemy is my friend is essentially what he says in response to this this clip and this part of his, his backstory. And what I found, what I, I think a lot of people found is that they could simultaneously be very uncomfortable with this footage and this appearance that he made, but also understand the political calculation and why he had to do it. Um, and again, I think that, that that the inclusion of that part of his story in the movie just makes him a more fascinating character. This guy is not some uh, pristine dude to be put on a pedestal. He is complicated and nuanced and there is complexity and very challenging aspects to his backstory that I was uncomfortable with. And the fact that we were giving, given free reign to explore those aspects of his history in the movie um, you know, were, were mission critical and very important to me personally. You know, th this film, of course, you know, the, the time period that you're capturing is so charged with politics. And in the case of Putin's Russia, politics that are that are in many cases deadly. And so I'm curious during the process, how how aware you allowed yourself to be of it and how did you was it was it part of the of the process or did you have to just kind of put that that outside pressure aside, especially when you've got, you know, right wingers uh, on both the Russian on the Russian side that are kind of just hammering uh, Navalny in the midst of all this. You're getting like real conversation uh, with the political leaders of Russia. And, and so you're asking about, sorry, the the, the risk assessment, the, the level of fear. How, yeah. How did did that play into it at all? Well, you know, we understood going into this that that this wasn't going to be a walk in, a, in the park and we're making a film about this guy who is who is an enemy number one of Vladimir Putin and his regime. Uh, we were in witness protection and, and that, you know, theoretically is intimidating. But what I found is that when you get there and you're standing next to this guy and you're kibitzing with him and, and hanging around and shooting, his courage quickly proliferates over the entire crew and you quickly acclimate to the level of danger that you had previously imagined and you stop thinking about it. Um, and you, some might call it naive, but at the end of the day, once we sort of started working, we didn't give the risk assessment too much thought after that. 
Subsequently, since the film has come out, the risk assessment has changed for many people chronicled and depicted in the film. Navalny is languishing in solitary confinement. His life is very much at risk. He could be killed at any moment. And his, and his stay in solitary confinement is predicated on his vehement opposition and outspoken opposition to this brutal war in Ukraine. Similarly, for Christo Grozev, the film's other subject, a Bulgarian nerd with a laptop, um, it's very well known at this point that he was put on Russia's kill list. Putin wants nothing more than to take his poison and feed it to Christo. Um, and so Christo has to take extraordinary security precautions to make sure um, that he is, is, is safe. Um, and that reality is very scary for us. And it extends also to many of Navalny's supporters and colleagues and family members as well. I feel like you know, there was a moment in this, the, the moment that I think a lot of people talk about with this film is the famous phone call um, where basically Navalny gets members of the conspiracy and one in particular to reveal how it was happening. And I assume that's not a moment you can plan for as a filmmaker. So were, how were you able to temper your 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 desire as a filmmaker with, oh, my God, listen to what he's getting out of it? I, could, I, I can just imagine my jaw being on the floor during those moments. Yeah, I mean, I don't speak a word of Russian. So when we were shooting that scene, I didn't really understand the intricacies of what were being said. But just reading the temperature in the room and reading the facial expressions, we understood, despite our language skills or lack of skills, we knew exactly what was happening. We knew that something explosive was being recorded. And I remember filming and 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 Maria's jaw, this is Navalny's chief investigator, she's depicted in the scene, her jaw unhinges and hits the floor. And in that moment, I just remember thinking to myself, you know, just keep shooting, just keep shooting, just keep shooting. There was enough battery, there was enough space on the hard drives, and I just wanted to make sure everything was in focus. And that was my that was my focus was making sure everything was looking right, and then we were capturing what we needed to capture. And Chris uh, Christo's face during that whole thing, I mean, it, it's so memeable of just the, the 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 range of emotions he goes through during that scene. And it actually became a meme and his sweater, his ugly, horrible sweater became very famous too. And listen, these are people who are like Eastern European and Russian. They don't emote very much up until this point. Maria's like emotional range towards me personally was like mildly annoyed to very annoyed. So for me to see her um, in just shock and awe, uh, you knew you knew exactly what was happening. It was, it was, can best be described as like a stunning scene and and that's truly what it was it was just stunning um and i'm really glad that we were there to to capture it the the final moments of the, the final kind of segment of navalny going back to russia um take us through that process because i have to i can only imagine what the emotion was like in because you've got his family there you've got what this means to him personally versus what it means politically what was it like to document that. You know, that day was one of the hardest days of my life. You know, I remember seeing Navalny on that morning. I was filming in the hotel room with him before he went back. And there was this viscous weight in the air, this heaviness that was lingering. It felt like we were sitting Shiva. It felt like we were <laughs> taking part in like a funeral procession or something like this. The unknowingness of what would happen when he returned to Russia, the unknowingness of what would happen to his family, what would happen to all of us. And it was just one of these moments where I really got through it by leaning into my job and leaning into the responsibility I had, which was to just keep shooting, make sure it's in focus, because I'm doing this not for this moment, but for history. And because we did our job that morning, the weight of that scene, the way it felt to be there is now translated and forever captured on film. The way it feels to see that movie, to see that scene in the movie is very much the way it felt to be in the room. Um, it was this extraordinary moment of unknowingness. Navalny landed, we watched him get whisked away. He was arrested um, and that was it. It was unceremonious, but it was dark and sinister and we knew that nothing good was to follow uh, what we couldn't have anticipated was just how dramatically um, Navalny's organization would be sort of shuttered and his people would be exiled and 
and and everything he had built would they would try their best to crush. But uh, I was unsurprised by the resilience of his foundation, the resilience of his staff, who very quickly got back on their feet and reconstituted their activities and, and their organization from the safety of Vilnius, Lithuania. Has now that the film is out there, and now that um, you know the story I, that I think a lot of people don't know. Now that you think that's out there, what do you see as kind of like the global? Uh, I don't mean to, this to sound presumptuous, like you intended to have some global impact, but have you seen the impact of this film um, just beyond just this story? Well, on a small scale, I've seen the impact on the, of the film written on the faces of the dozens and dozens of and hundreds of young Russian men and women who have approached me after screenings. These are young Russian people, many newly exiled from their country, who have, for the most far, part, felt um, an exhausting sense of shame, a deep, deep shame of their nationality, a shame of their Russianness. Uh, shame and disgust about this war, a war they don't support, um, and fear of the unknowingness of what's to come. They are living, for many of these people, uh, in a sea of darkness, which doesn't compare to um, how many of their Ukrainian colleagues are, and, and friends are feeling now, having been thrusted into this wartime scenario. But something that I am inspired by are the, the faces of these people after they see our movie, whom for a brief moment experience just a flicker, a little tiny flicker of hope. They see our film and amidst the sea of darkness in Navalny, what they find is a little light. And that light is Navalny and what he represents for the future of Russia, the future of Russian democracy and the end of this brutal regime. And for me, that is really inspiring when people come up to me and tell them that they connected with the film on that level, especially Russians and especially Ukrainians. On the more global scale, the mission of the film is to keep Navalny's name in the global consciousness and to remind the world about the fragility of democracy and remind everyone who sees this movie that the plight of Navalny is not just a Russian plight. You know, the tides of authoritarianism, um, brush in and out all over the world, even in the United States. And I think that what Putin and, and, and his regime represents is a canary in the coal mine for many other nations as well. And the film on that level is, is a very important tool. And, and I'm very glad that it has been widely seen, not just by film audiences and film goers, but also by influential decision makers and politicians um, and people with power. Uh, very, very well said. And Putin's time is <laughs> not short enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, Daniel, congratulations on all of the success with this film and, and best of luck at the Oscars. Uh, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Oscars and stay tuned uh, for more interviews leading up to Oscar night. Daniel Rohr, Navalny, um, a great pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Tony. It was a pleasure to be here.